And the next video is going to be about the second quantum number called the orbital quantum number or the angular momentum quantum number. So what does that mean? What does that represent? Well, remember there were four quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. And we talked about n before. That's called the principal quantum number that defines the energy levels, the regions around the nucleus where electrons can reside as far as the, how much energy they have. The more energy they have, the higher energy level they will be at. So N describes that energy level. Those are the shells, the regions where electrons can exist. Now, electrons will also have what we call angular momentum. Now, let's refresh our memory about what angular momentum is. Well, whenever an object goes around in a circular path around a central point like this, it will do that at a distance called r. This is then called a position vector, how far away you are from the, from the central point where do you go around in an orbit, and then this is the object, let's say it's a small electron, it has a velocity v, and so we can determine the angular momentum as simply being the cross product of the position vector and the momentum, momentum being the mass times the velocity. Of course, for small electrons that doesn't really work. This is something that only really works for large objects. We can talk about the angular momentum of a large object. Remember, angular momentum is a vector, a vector that can be determined by using your right hand, Take your finger and curl your fingers in the direction of the motion of the object. Your thumb will then be pointing in the direction of the angular momentum vector. For example, here, let's say we have a small electron going around the nucleus of an atom, goes around in a circle, draw your fingers around the path of the orbit of the electron, your thumb will point in the direction of the angular momentum vector, which, as you can see, is always going to be perpendicular to the plane. So if this is the plane of the orbit of the electron, the angular momentum will stick out perpendicular like that from that plane. But again, I need to caution you, that works at the macro scale with large objects like the moon going around the earth, the earth going around the sun, or a ball and a string going around uh, as you're twirling around like that. All that works, but it doesn't quite work for the small quantum level. When we get down to the size of an atom, and we talk about electrons and neutrons and protons and things like that, all of a sudden this whole theory kind of falls apart. They still have angular momentum, but at that level we realize that the angular momentum is quantized. It can only have stepwise increases in how much angular momentum an object can have. And that stepwise increase is defined by this little letter, letter L, letter L right here, which is one of the four principal quantum numbers. I shouldn't call them principal quantum numbers, this is the principal one. This one here is called well, the angular momentum quantum number. It defines how much angular momentum an electron can have. And it's defined by the values of L, and of course those values of L are contained specifically depending upon the situation of the electron around the nucleus. Now, L can have different values. L can be equal to 0, L can be equal to 1, L can be equal to 2, L can be equal to 3, and so forth. Only those values. L can only be integers starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. Now, the angular momentum that an electron can have can only be this only be the square root of L times L plus 1 times H bar. H bar, of course, remember, is H divided by 2 pi, and H, of course, is Planck's constant, which defines the incremental increase in energy, and in this case, angular momentum, a small object like an electron can have. Now, L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2, L equals 3 has a specific meaning. What does it mean? Well, in the case of L being equal to 1, this represents the s orbitals. This represents the, uh, maybe I shouldn't call them orbitals yet, let me just call them s shells or subshells. That's a better name for them. Let's call them subshells. Subshells, hard to say. All right. And so when L equals 1, it represents the angle momentum electron can have when it resides in the s orbitals or the s subshells. Remember those are the spherical regions where electrons can reside. Now when L equals 1, that is, L is equal to 1 when the electron resides in the p subshells. And we'll learn just soon enough what those p subshells look like. They don't look like spherical shells, they look kind of like dumbbells, and we'll, we'll talk about those later, but that's a different region where electrons can exist, and that is a simple result from the fact that electrons can have angular momentum when L equals 1 in specific fashion that determines the size of those shells and the shape of those shells. L equals 2, that is representative of the d subshells. 
and L equals 3, that is representative of the F subshells. And again, those are specific structures that electrons can exist in, the probability shapes of where electrons can exist based upon the angular momentum of the electron. Now let's try to find some of these values. Let's plug these values in here. When L is equal to 1, or I should say when L is equal to 0, what does the angular momentum become? Angular momentum L will then be equal to the square root of 0 times 0 plus 1 times h bar. And well, that looks like it's 0. Wow, that's interesting. When an electron is in an S subshell in the lowest energy state, it doesn't have any angular momentum. That is kind of odd because normally when an object goes around in a circle around some central point, it does have angular momentum, but this tells us it does not. And the reason why, and we'll go and explain that a little bit more detail at a later point, when an electron resides in the S subshells, that is a spherical shaped shell, and the electron can take on any direction. It doesn't go around the nucleus in just a single path. It can go around the nucleus in any different direction. There is no specific probability that the electron will go in one direction over another. And because of that, the electron does not have angular momentum. In the P subshells, there's a different story here. We can actually calculate the angular momentum there by plugging L equals 1. So let's do that for L equals 1. The angular momentum will be equal to the square root of 1 times 1 plus 1 times h bar. And of course, this is 1 plus 1 is 2 times 1 is 2. That would be the square root of 2 times h bar. That would be the angular momentum of an electron that resides in one of the P subshells. And it looks like it doesn't really matter which P subshell it belongs to. The, the second level, the third level, the fourth level, in all cases, the angular momentum of the electron will always be equal to exactly the square root of h bar. When L is equal to 3, we can then say that, of course, these are the, this is the what we call the angular momentum quantum number. We can't forget what L stands for. That will then give us an angular momentum of equal to 1. No, in this case, oh, I jumped 1. I should have said 2. All right. So it's equal to 2 times 2 plus 1 times h bar. So 2 plus 1 is 3 times 2 is 6. So that would be equal to the square root of 6 times h bar. Notice that the angular momentum of the electron cannot be 1 h bar, 2 h bar, 3 h bar. It can only be exactly the square root of 2 times h bar or the square root of 6 times h bar. And that will be dependent upon what the angular momentum quantum number is. If L is equal to 3, then the angular momentum will be equal to the square root of 3 times 3 plus 1 times h bar. That will be 4 times 3, which is the square root of 12 times h bar. So the electron can only have very, very specific uh, moment of inertia, or I should say angular momentum, depend upon what the L quantum numbers are, which we call the orbital quantum numbers. And notice that depending upon the value of the orbital quantum number, the, the location where the electron can exist will be specified by the type of subshell that can exist under these circumstances. Now, what are the limitations of what these numbers can be? Well, it turns out the limitation is that L can be equal to 0, 1, 2, and so forth, all the way up to n minus 1. And that's a very, very important restriction because that determines the kind of subshells that can exist at the various energy levels. Notice when n is equal to 1, and remember that n is the principal quantum numbers of the four quantum numbers that define the structure of the orbits of electrons. When n is equal to 1, when we're at the lowest energy level, L can only be 0 because it can only be up to 1 less than n, which means that the lowest energy level, that defines that L can only be equal to 0, which means that that energy level, you can only have this kind of subshell and these kind of orbitals. You can only have s orbitals at the n equals 1 uh, energy level. You can't have any p orbitals, any d orbitals, only s orbitals. That's the only structure you can have there. Now, at the next energy level, n equals 2, L can now be equal either to 0 or 1, because 1 is 1 less than 2, so it could be 0 or 1, which means at the next energy level, you can have both S-type subshells, or S orbitals, and P orbitals. 
So that defines where electrons can exist and what kind of orbitals they can have or what they, they can exist in at the next energy level. At the third energy level, n equals 3, L can be 0, oop, that should be equal sign, L can be 0, 1, or 2. So L can take on three possible values at the third energy level, which means at the third energy level, we can have, have s orbitals, we can have p orbitals, and we can have d orbitals. The more orbitals you can have, the more electrons you can have at that particular energy level. And we'll learn later how many that is. Turns out at the s orbital level, you can only have two. At the p, you can have six. At the d, you can have 10. So therefore, at the third energy level, since you can have both s orbitals, p orbitals, and d orbitals, you can have 2 plus 6 plus 10 electrons at that energy level. 2 plus 6 plus 10, that adds up to 18, which means at the third energy level, you can have 18 electrons. At the second energy level, you can only have s orbitals and p orbitals, 2 electrons there, 6 electrons there, that's a total of 8 electrons. So at the second energy level, you can only have a total of 8 electrons, and so forth. And we'll get into the details of that at a later video. But here you can see that the fact that Electrons travel around the nucleus in various shapes and forms. Those are called orbitals. And because they're all different in shape, we are limited to what type of shapes can exist, and we're limited to the type of shapes you can have at the various energy levels because at the quantum level, at the very small level of, of atoms and electrons, those electrons can only take very specific values for the angular momentum, which confines them in very specific shapes at the various energy levels. And this is how that is defined. And hopefully, that will give you a better understanding of what the orbital quantum number L stands for and what it means in terms of how the shapes of the orbitals are, are structured and how, at the various energy levels, you can only have certain types of subshells and suborbitals.